our program this evening is, is actually uh, um, quite serious, uh, quite sobering. And it involves looking at the present state of belief in the culture that we happen to find ourselves. And it, it's, it's a state of belief that we end up with, a culture that we end up with, when truth is devalued and delegitimized. De it's so what happens when the credibility of the Bible is attacked and the authority of men is set over and above what the scriptures say, what God says, and what is truth. And perhaps for us, most seriously, it's what happens when believers have not equipped themselves and their families to answer for the hope that they have and to be able to successfully argue against and refute the errors and conclusions of false knowledge, knowledge so-called. So, -called. so I, I think given the subject of our earlier considerations that it's only fitting that we conclude our studies this afternoon in looking at the results of a broad-ranging and unrelenting siege on truth and God's authority. So to do that, we'll be looking at a number of uh, survey results that have been taken recently. So I'll do a lot of reading, but you'll be able to uh, to be able to understand and see for what's going on. Now, almost a decade ago, maybe you saw this on the newsstands at the time, or happened to to know of it. But almost a decade ago, Newsweek ran a somewhat sensationalist cover story, which starkly announced, as you can see here, the decline and fall of Christian America. And the article uh, referenced a, a 2008 survey, <clears throat> which was entitled The American Religious Identification Survey. And among its key findings was that the American population self-identifies as predominantly Christian, but Americans are slowly becoming less Christian. For example, 86% of American adults identified as Christians in 1990 and 76% in 2008. Also quoting, the historic mainline churches and denominations have experienced the steepest declines while the non-denominational Christian identity has been trending upward, particularly since 2001. And that meshes with what we said about people shying away from, from uh, truth and believing there is a truth to sort of uh, merging into... To, in a non-denominational form of Christianity, and I think that might explain um, explain that upward trend. But the challenge, and another quote, the challenge to Christianity in the U.S. does not come from other religions, but rather from a rejection of all forms of organized religion. The U.S. population continues to show signs of becoming less religious, with one out of every five Americans failing to indicate a religious identity in 2008. One sign of the lack of attachment of Americans to religion is that 27 percent do not expect a religious funeral at their death. So fully one quarter of Americans don't expect to have any sort of religious trappings or ceremony when they're dead. <clears throat> now as a result of this survey data, the writer suggested that God is less of a force in American politics and culture than at any other time in recent memory. Well, it doesn't take a lot to come to that conclusion, to be able to see that just in daily life. You don't, you don't need the statistics to see that, right? God is less of a force in American politics and culture than at any other time in recent memory. Now, around the same time, a research group research company named the Barna Group published a report entitled, A New Generation Expresses Its Skepticism and Frustration with Christianity, September 2007. Quote, the study shows that 16 to 29 year olds exhibit a greater degree of criticism towards Christianity than did previous generations when they were at the same stage of life. In fact, in just a decade, Many of the Barnum measures of the Christian image have shifted substantially downward, fueled in part by a growing sense of disengagement and disillusionment among young people. For instance, a decade ago, the vast majority of Americans outside the Christian faith, 
including young people, felt favorably towards Christianity's roles in society. In other words, if you weren't a Christian, you at least thought it, it was good what they did and, and you had no problems with it. Currently, however, just 16% of non-Christians in their late teens and 20s said they have a good impression of Christianity. That's what we're dealing with. People who are not already Christians or have religious backgrounds of that sort, just 16% of those feel favorably towards Christians and what they believe according to the results of this survey. Barna Group published a report entitled, Atheism Doubles Among Generation Z. Quote, Intergeneration Z, born between 1999 and 2015, they are truly the first post-Christian generation. More than any other generation before them, Generation Z does not assert a religious identity. They might be drawn to things spiritual, but with a vastly different starting point from previous generations, many of whom received a basic education on the Bible and Christianity. And it shows the percentage of Gen Z that identifies as atheist is double that of the U.S. population. Another quote for Generation Z, atheist is no longer a dirty word. The percentage of teens who identify as such is double that of the general population, 13% versus 6% of all adults. So what has led to this precipitous falling off? Barna asked non-Christians of all ages about their biggest barriers to faith. Gen Z non-believers have much in common with their older counterparts in this regard, but a few differences stand out. Teens, along with young adults, are more likely than older Americans to say the problem of evil and suffering is a deal breaker for them. That's because the God that they know and the God that they think exists wouldn't allow what they see in the world today. And you know what the problem is there? They don't know who God is. It appears that today's youth, like so many throughout history, struggle to find a compelling argument for the existence of both evil and a good and loving God. They can't understand if God is good, why is the world evil? They can't get past that, and it's our job to educate them on that. More than one-third of Generation Z, 37%, believes it is not possible to know for sure if God is real compared to 32% of all adults. On the other side of the coin, teens who do believe one um, two teens who do believe uh, that we can know God exists are less likely than adults to say that they are very convinced um, that is true. For many teens, truth seems relative at best and at worst altogether unknowable. You see what that is? That's, that's a fruit of the culture, that the teens, the youngest generation, has the wrong idea about truth. Their lack of confidence is on pace with the broader culture's all-out embrace of relativism. More than half of all Americans, both teens, 58%, and adults, 62%, agree with the statement, many religions can lead to eternal life. There is no one true religion. And that's exactly what we talked about in the first class, the pluralistic society, the prominence of that belief that there's no one true religion, and therefore, who are Christadelphians to say that we alone have truth, right? There's a sense among Generation Z that what's true for someone else may not be true for me. They are much less apt than older adults, especially boomers at 85%, to agree that a person can be wrong about something they sincerely believe in. For a considerable minority of teens, sincerely believing something makes it true. So just because you believe something deeply and sincerely, you feel it to be true, that is truth to them. And what a mistaken view of truth that is. In a report entitled <clears throat> Exodus, how's that for biblical? Why Americans are leaving religion and why they're unlikely to come back. Research group PRRI had this to say about America's faith. Although most religiously unaffiliated Americans do not reject outright a belief in God, they express many more doubts about the existence of a higher power than other Americans. The majority, 53%, of religiously unaffiliated Americans say that they sometimes doubt whether the God exists, while more than 4 in 10 disagree that God exists. Americans who identify with non-Christian religions are more likely than other religious Americans to say they sometimes doubt the existence 
of God. So these statistics I present to you almost without comment because they pretty much speak for themselves. But what I will say to this, and this for me is what's truly alarming, is that among this Generation Z, this first post-generation, this first post-Christian generation, among this generation are my own children, and perhaps some of yours. You see, <clears throat> they are growing up in spiritual Athens. They're growing up in a place where the authority of God's word is not broadly recognized and accepted. They're growing up in a place where the truth of the Bible, God's objective truth, is simply one truth among many. And this has this new reality has important ramifications for our community of believers both in how we as brothers and sisters seek to strengthen that which remains, as well as for how we instruct and prepare our youth to deal with the culture that we find ourselves in. Remember, they're swimming in an ocean, swimming in an ocean every day, subjected to the horrible fruits of this culture. And that's not something just to ignore or take lightly. It's deadly serious. Well, there's a heavy emphasis in the Bible on instructing youth in the way of God's truth. And I want to spend some time looking at that because that's part of what I'm hoping to show tonight, that we must not leave behind the responsibility that we have as parents and elders in this community to properly bring up our youth in the ways of truth and righteousness and in knowing who God is and what his plan is with the earth. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou, when, when thou risest up. So this is um, basically the, the word of God here is, is to constantly be on our lips. And, and I know that can certainly seem hard to do, but if we're always putting the Word of God into our minds, we're always putting it into our minds. In theory, it should always be what's coming out, right? So always talk about the truth. And this word, teach them diligently, it's actually a bit more for forceful than, than teaching them diligently. If you look at what this says in another translation, the NIV, for example, it says, Impress them on your children. Impress. And it's as it, it's, you mean, they have um, like a seal in, in the signet rings where you're pressing into hot wax. And you're not just leaving an impression, you're leaving a lasting, permanent impression. And that's really the, the, the thrust of this passage is that when you're teaching your children diligently, when you're doing it the right way, you are impressing upon them God's truth. And that impression, you can't, you can't erase that at any point in your life. No matter how far away uh, somebody may happen to get, they will always have that background, that base knowledge of God's objective truth. It's, it's to indelibly inscribe the truth of God on their hearts. That's what this is about. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, Solomon asks his son for his heart. He says, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Allow me to imprint on your heart. And that is the goal of spiritually educating our children to touch their heart. As Proverbs chapter 22 and, and verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from that. And there's a comment on this from Brother W.J. Elson. And I have a host of quotes from a book called The Christadelphian Treasury, uh, also available in our library. Perhaps uh, most of you have it in your libraries as well or at home. But uh, I'll, I'll describe it as simply collated wisdom of, of brothers from our early on in our community, uh, themselves drawing from the Word of God. And uh, 
there is indeed much wisdom in there to be found um, if you desire. But this is what he says. <clears throat> if the law of righteousness can be impressed on the mind of a child to a sufficient depth and with sufficient clearness, the impression will be clear in an old age. Old people forget the events. This is uh, his words, not mine. Don't, don't, don't come yelling at me. Old people forget events of yesterday, but the instructions of childhood are still operative. This is key. The noble work of parents, then, is to instill in the child a keen appetite for wisdom, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. You want to instill in them a love of the right, of the best kind of learning. To engrave the law upon their heart, to impress thoughts of holiness upon the mind, and to keep these impressions until the character is fixed, until it's indelible. Then, even in old age, this character will remain. With, with, the, with the added comment, all parents fail to do this work perfectly, but the proverb is not disproved thereby. The idea is that if you do it the right way, it will take, it will stick. So we have to develop and cultivate a love of truth among our children. And what I'll say to this point, brothers and sisters, is it doesn't come naturally. Because how do you think the world got to be where it is today with the different philosophies that have no conception of the right idea of truth? Because truth, objective truth, genuine truth, does not come naturally. It comes from God. So we don't want to just tell our children what they need to believe. That isn't the way we ought to go about instructing our youth and just believe this, believe that, be baptized and you're good. And, and, and not that I'm suggesting anybody here does that, but I think it is important um, to, to see it is more about telling our children what the truth is. It's, it's more than telling them what they have to believe. And this is a quote that, that really speaks to that. I've already got it up here. I see that. Um, Isaac Collier, a lot of wisdom also in his books. He says, if you force a system of thought on a child and yet fail to fetter his intellect completely, there will be an inevitable reaction which may easily carry him astray. If he learns the pros of the case by statute labor and yet is left free to seek out the cons for himself in later life, i.e. to find other truths, maybe more uh, appealing truths, which side would you expect him to learn most thoroughly? That which is forced upon him, or that which he seeks for himself. We never learn a lesson thoroughly under the fear of the cane. And that's what I mean, is you don't want to just tell your children what to believe. In a pair of passages from Deuteronomy, again drives home the importance of getting God's word into our hearts, and into our children's hearts. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 10 from the NIV. Only be careful. And watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. And this is dealing with the children of Israel having seen the incredible miracles and the deliverance of the, of the people from Egypt. God is saying, don't forget these things that you've seen because they are important. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before Yahweh your Elohim at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. In Deuteronomy 11. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And the Jews, of course, have taken this literally. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. You think it's important to put the words of truth in our heart, brothers and sisters? Of course it is. Of course it is. Have the word, as we said, constantly in discussion. Show it. Model it. Live it. Be the truth to them. Live your faith. And that's what faith is. It's not just a belief. It's a, it's a, it's a belief that lives. Here's a quote from 
Sister S.J. Ladson has also found in the Christadelphian treasury. The relation of the father to his children should be in miniature what we know the divine attitude to be towards us, a blending of goodness and severity, the latter not prominent unless there is refusal to walk in harmony with him. But though love is the basis of all, yet the truest kindness cannot exist without firmness. And if obedience is not insisted upon in early days, the child is not likely to realize the claim of God in later life. A firm and consistent example of always setting the Lord before us and considering the end is the most powerful influence of all in turning the thoughts of the young in a wise direction. Such an attitude is strong in molding their lifelong principles and likely to cause the desire to follow them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know, John's third letter is addressed to his dear friend Gaius. And in it, John expresses that he expresses joy that Gaius is still walking faithfully and considering him as a child. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And that's the joy that we strive for, brothers and sisters, one of, one of the joys that we can have in this life, knowing that our children walk in truth. So this instruction to our youth should not only equip them to accept and understand the truth, but to be able also to do as Stephen and Paul were able to do. To make a reasoned defense, an apologia of it. Stephen was able to do this in Jerusalem among the God-fearing Jews, and Paul was able to do it in the context of a pagan and pantheistic Athens. The preaching of the first century disciples, as we saw, appealed to reason and facts. These, these were things you, you could not rationally argue against. And the fact is, brothers and sisters, we should not shy away from incorporating this into the instruction of our youth. Throughout Paul's ministry, Paul continually appealed to reason and evidence in support of his faith. Blind faith? Not here, brothers and sisters. Not here. Not us. Again and again, Paul goes into the synagogues and reasons. He presents logical arguments for the truth of his position. He doesn't say, guys, believe me, what I'm saying is true. He gives them reason and evidence to take what he says as truth. And these were things that could not be rationally argued against. Acts chapter 17 and verse 2. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. And this word reason here is the Greek word dialegami, and it means to say thoroughly or to discuss either an argument or excitation, to dispute, to preach unto, to reason with, to speak, not just to answer questions and to be there on a casual basis and, and hopefully people believe what you say. Paul was serious about this. Acts 17, verse 7, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met him. Acts 18, 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 18, 9, And he came to Ephesus and left from there, but he himself entered in the synagogue, and reasoned with the Jews. Acts 19, 8, And he went into the synagogue, and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing, reasoning, and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Blind faith, brothers and sisters, not Paul, not you, not me. Paul wasn't making faith-based claims that were circular in nature. He was appealing to the evidence for Christ's resurrections in the known facts of the time. This happened. These things weren't done in a corner. How about the day of Pentecost? Pouring out of the Holy Spirit gifts. What was Peter's argument to those who had gathered? How did he appeal to all those people? He says that you're all witnesses. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. 
This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. The people there knew Jesus was raised. That wasn't a secret. Sure, there were maybe theories out there about what happened. But they knew they were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, the Holy Spirit, which ye now see and hear. See, guys, it's undeniable, he said to them. What we have right here with us is the evidence of God's truth, that these things are true. The Holy Spirit gifts. We are all witnesses, was Peter's argument to the people on the day of Pentecost. And again, when he was uh, at the temple with the Jews, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. After healing the, the lame beggar, the Jews came rushing over to Peter. I'm reading from the NIV, this is what he says. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name in the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Peter put to them that the healing of this beggar, whom everybody knew was a beggar and was lame and had been such from his childhood, Peter said to them, the fact that I've healed them is evidence to the truth of the claims of Jesus Christ. He was appealing to known facts that Jesus had been killed by the Jews. Then he appealed to the known fact of the resurrection. Now, his argument would have had no force or power if the resurrection had not taken place. And if everybody knew that was so, if everybody knew the resurrection was a sham and a conspiracy theory, the arguments the apostles used in the first century would have had no force. And brothers, do you really think Christianity would have spread like it did in the first century? If these, if, if these were just a bunch of clever, crafty lies? Really? Because I don't believe that. So these things had taken place, and everybody knew it. And Peter appealed to that. So if that wasn't enough, as we said, Peter uses the case of the lame man. You know, everybody knew that. Acts chapter 4, verse 16 the aftermath of that incident. And when Peter and John were brought before the Jewish rulers the next day, do you know what? They were powerless to argue against the evidence. It's, it's right there in, in your Bible. That's what's written. They were powerless to argue against the evidence. What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They could not deny the things that had been done and were being done. Because we now live in spiritual Athens, the instruction of our youth, if it doesn't already, should also include evidence for the truth of God's Word. To show them the factual grounds the Word of God stands on and the evidence which supports those beliefs. And of course, it is fair and right to say that we don't have the same sorts of, of gifts and powers that were uh, in use by the disciples in the first century to prove and testify to the truth of God, but we certainly have other means of, of our disposal, uh, not least of which all of the host of fulfilled prophecies that have been fulfilled in the time since the disciples, the fact that we have the whole complete Bible before us uh, in an understanding uh, of the truth, uh, the archaeological evidence speaking to the truth of the biblical record, uh, all sorts of other ways that we can, we can prove and demonstrate by evidence the, the truth of, of the Bible. We don't have the luxury of hoping that our children and our youth 
we'll just sort everything out and come to the right conclusions. This is something that we have to be active about. We can't take a, a backseat lackadaisical approach uh, of just bringing them to, to, uh, to Sunday school and memorial and, and maybe even sometimes Bible class as they get a little older, CYCs. All these things are great, but they're simply only a component of a larger spiritual education that they must be receiving. And, and of course, the, the ones chiefly responsible for that is, of course, the parents. And um, we as parents must understand our role and how critical it is to the development of our children in the ways of truth. It's not something to be taken lightly. God has entrusted us with these gifts, children, the heritage of Yahweh. There's a book called Already Gone, subtitled, <clears throat> Why Your Kids Will Quit Church and what you can do to stop it. Here's a quote uh, that, that says here, unless the facts behind the Christian faith are clearly and convincingly communicated in a way that young Bible students can learn and remember, their faith will not stand the assault of doubt from the world, the siege on truth. It's not enough just to tell students. We can't just tell them, believe in Jesus. Faith that is not founded on fact will ultimately falter in the storm of secularism that our students face every day. Of course, no matter how good the instruction that our children receive, doubts may inevitably arise and perhaps in some cases will arise. Human nature, of course, being what it is trying to find its own way to truth, to look inside for the truth. And if we don't address these doubts early, as we see them in our children and the questions that they have, if we cannot give them the answers to, the, to, to, to their questions, do you know who is all too ready and all too willing to give them answers? The culture, the world. They're very much eager to put their wisdom into the hearts of our children. Just remember that. If we don't educate them, somebody else will. And you can bet that that's not going to be in line with how God would have them educated. So if we leave this, th th these problems of doubt, these questions, if we leave them unaddressed, the, th this doubt festers like an infected wound. And brothers and sisters, that is an ugly illustration. That is an ugly picture, a festering infected wound. And just as infections can sometimes lead to death, so too their doubt. Their faith will fail them. Again from Brother Islip. How many cases can you call to mind of men and women who embraced the hope of Israel, entered the sin-covering name, remained faithful, and even enthusiastic for a time, and then drifted right away? They can be numbered by the hundred. Why did they go? What was the underlying cause of their weakness? There can be no doubt that for some cause their faith has failed. Can we be certain that there are not similar causes operating now? And if we admit the danger, is it possible to heal up those breaches before they grow too wide? What was the ostensible cause of departure in those unfortunate cases which have come under our notice? If we probe the matter a little further, we generally find the deserter inclined to raise difficulties which indicate only too plainly that doubts have arisen in their mind and that, faithlessness, that his faithless action arises from the simple and obvious cause that faith has left his heart. So when you have a young person come up to you and, and they ask you, well, how, how can Christadelphians claim to have the truth? You better have a defense for that because there's only one road that line of questioning leads to if you can't answer it. This is deadly serious. So, <clears throat> what about those who doubt? 
we looked at some alarming st uh, statistics at the beginning, uh, but the fact is doubt is by no means a strictly modern phenomenon. We have accounts uh, in the Bible of this. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 24, it's the account of a boy who was prone to seizures. The boy's father had sought help from Jesus' disciples who were not able to heal him. This man wanted, desperately wanted to believe the power of God could save his son. He, he wanted to believe the disciples could do it. He knew of the miracles they had done before. He wanted to believe, but he, 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 didn't, have, um, he didn't have what he needed. He didn't have what he needed. He didn't have the healing of his son. It was personal for him. So this man just needed to see the evidence. He just needed to see it for himself with his own eyes. He cried out, Lord, I, I believe. Help thou mine own belief. I want to believe that this is the truth of the gospel. Help me. How about one of Jesus' own disciples? One of those closest to Jesus in his earthly life. Thomas, the most famous hardened skeptic of all, as we'll call Thomas, but I don't want to be too hard on him. But I think he was specifically put in the gospel to appeal to those with the hardened and skeptical heart. The example that we have, that even this man could have evidence put forward to him he could not reject and could not deny. He says, except I shall see the, his hands, in his hands the print of the nails, he says, and put my finger uh, into the print of the nails and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. John chapter 20 and verse 25. What did, <clears throat> what did Jesus say in response to Thomas? Because this is most instructive. He says, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach thither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Jesus gave Thomas the evidence he needed to believe. And it's Jesus' response in both of these cases that is our example for responding to those who doubt. The approach is described simply by Jude, verse 22, when he says, Be merciful to those who doubt. Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't come to them questioning their faith. How could you believe this or that? Why did you go and do this thing? Be merciful to those who doubt. We have to respond with understanding and compassion and do everything we can do to get them the answers, to get to the root of their doubt and put the evidence before them that they need to believe. That is our responsibility as their brothers and sisters. And even for our young people who never came to accept the truth and be baptized, that is still our responsibility to put to them the evidence they need to see the truth of God. We remember the parable of the shepherd who left the 99 sheep to go and rescue the one who, who was lost. What's the principle there? Seek after that which is lost. And brothers and sisters, we have a lot of lost among us. Seek after that which is lost. What about the father who watched every day, hoping his son lost to the world would return? Brothers and sisters, we have to watch. We have to look for the return of our young people. We read in James chapter 5 and verses 19 through 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And, and what a wonderful thing to be able to say that God was able to use us in a way that saved a soul from death. What a joy. What a joy. And that's the task of each of us, to convert those who err from the truth. 
So the question before us is, of course, how do we answer those who doubt? And as we saw with Paul and in how he used his approach in speaking with the Greeks and taking the truth to them, our approach needs to be specific to the nature of the doubt. Not one size fits all, not telling them about the truth. It's more than that. And so you largely have, we'll say, three classes of doubt. And the first of these, we would say, is based on, they, they doubt the evidence for the truth of the Bible, evidentiary doubt. Now, it's true that in our day, as I said, we don't have the advantage of performing miracles to prove our faith. And of course, even then, you'd have people that uh, were irrational about it, and they still wouldn't believe. But, but the point is that we don't have that to make our task easier, is what we'll say. But that doesn't mean that the realm of fact and evidence is closed off from us. And, and there's a whole category of Christian literature that examines the factual evidence for the truth of God's Word in its very existence. And it's apologetics, and perhaps some of you already are familiar with, uh, with that particular genre uh, of literature. And it, it's, it's things that get into fulfilled prophecies, uh, reasons we know the Bible is true. And, and to some extent, we do have a little bit of that in our community. Um, but, but this is much more extensive and in-depth with well, all sorts of scholarliness attached to it and, and um, um, things that can be very useful in, in bringing the truth to others. You, of course, know C.S. Lewis, perhaps mostly for his Chronicles of Narnia books, but for, he, he was an example of somebody that was a Christian apologist. Uh, the, the works that he wrote were in defense of Christian faith, and his most well-known work uh, is Mere Christianity. There's another book called uh, Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison, and that specifically is dealing with uh, the resurrection account and how even looking at within the gospel records themselves, uh, th there are things which very much suggest that th it could not have been fabricated accounts. And that's also very interesting. And there's, there's a whole, whole subgenre of resurrection evidence books, uh, by the way, if you really get into it. And it's, uh, it's really an unbelievable amount of literature that, that uh, devoted and sincere Christians ha ha have written on these things. And of course, you, you must take, take some of them with a grain of salt. Uh, you'll run into, of course, a doctrinal things we disagree on and don't see eye to eye on, but uh, there are things in these works that I believe that we can use to our advantage, as Paul did with the Greek literature. And as I said, there, some Christadelphians writers have also done apologetics. Uh, I've quoted, um, actually I'm not sure if this one made it in, but Robert Roberts wrote a book, Is There a God?, which is in the form of a conversation between a believer and a skeptic who, who doesn't believe God exists, and it is very good, a lot of, lot of good arguments in there good introduction to the different types of arguments that are used in defense uh, of faith. Isaac Collier has written two. One is Conviction and Conduct. I have a number of quotes from here throughout, as well as Vox Day. And those are also uh, very good starting places. So if you're new to that, um, that I'm just going to put that out there for you, that that may be something, uh, if you have someone in, you know, in your own ecclesia that uh, you have in mind, there are, there are resources that can help you talk to to those who have left the flock. But this, this, this particular approach, apologetics, is not a surefire fix, because the fact is not everybody doubts the truth of the Bible on the basis of evidence. Okay, Not everybody doubts because they don't think the evidence is good enough. You've got some people who doubt on emotional grounds. Okay, Matters of conscience. They might ask questions like, if God is all-powerful and loving, then why is there so much evil in the world? And as we saw, that was one of the huge things for Generation Z. They, they can't square the two. They can't reconcile it. Why did God command his people in the Old Testament to commit acts of genocide, among other moral sins? And, and, and we know the rap that, that God gets, and, and particularly the, the new atheist literature today, you know, God is not great. And, and Richard Dawkins and his ilk uh, saying, uh, saying terrible, terrible things about God. They ask questions like, if God is a God of love, then how could not everyone will be saved? Or, if God made or caused people to be born with same-sex attractions, then why does the Bible prohibit people, people from living a lifestyle consistent with that attraction and condemn those who, who do? 
And that's a major stumbling block because now you have young people growing up who have friends, close friends, who are, um, you know, in that, in that sort of lifestyle. And, and so it's close to them. It hits home for them that, well, I love so-and-so. He's a great, great person. What, what is God's problem with him? You know, if, if God can't love so-and-so, faults and all, how can I love God for that? And that is a huge issue right now, a huge issue. Or perhaps something terrible has happened to them. Maybe they've gotten cancer. Or maybe somebody they know, somebody they're very close to has gotten cancer or, or some other serious tragic accident has befallen them and, and irreversibly changed their life. So some, some, something terrible. And the default is to be angry at God. If there's a God, why did he let this happen? Right? So these are the things that we need to, to look out uh, among our own young people and even even those of those of us who, who are older and baptized at times perhaps we, we have that same weakness and we question why God can allow certain things and whenever that happens brothers and sisters it's it's the thinking of the natural mind that's creeping back into our minds when we are when we allow ourselves to entertain and give place to, to those sorts of thoughts and we need to recognize that very quickly and grab that thought and put it out of our mind, and put the Word of God back into it. So for this class of people, it's not about the evidence. They just can't comprehend how a loving God can exist in the face of these sorts of questions, and they can't in good conscience accept Him and subject themselves to His authority. So they may, they may say, okay, well, yeah, I, I get that God exists, whatever, but I, I just can't bring myself to, to come to terms and reconcile with who God is, with, with what I believe about the world, what I believe is true about the world. No amount of rational arguing is going to help somebody. You, you can't pull out an apologetics book off the shelf and hint to them. That's not the problem for them. This is the feelings of the heart we're talking about. It stems from the fact is that their understanding of who God is is flawed. Further developing or amending their understanding of God, of who God is exactly, I think will go a long way towards beginning to answer that doubt because they have the wrong idea of who God is. They have, they have in their mind the God they want to exist, right? God created man in his image, and ever since then we've been returning the favor creating God in our image. So they, they have to come to see that by their line of questioning, it doesn't follow that God doesn't or cannot exist. It's just that their ideas of what is right and just clearly doesn't align with God's. And they have to, to be open to having their views changed on that in order to, to be effective in showing them who God is. So we would do well to remember the analogy set forth by God and recorded by the prophet Isaiah. We are but the clay to God's potter. So um, just because someone has an idea about what is right doesn't mean it is right. You know, God is, is simply... Um, using us a, a, as clay, what, what God says is right. And it is God who ought to be the one that molds us. Now you have another category of doubt, what we'll call volitional doubt. And it involves those who are unwilling to acquiesce to the subjection God's truth demands, even if it has pr been proven to their satisfaction. And we, we looked at the, the quotes from, from um, I think it was... Uh, Thomas Nagel, the professor at NYU, and Nietzsche uh, about not believing in God. And Nietzsche said, even if, you could, even if you could show God was true and he exists, I still wouldn't believe in him, in effect. And, and Thomas Nagel says, well, I don't want there to be God, and I, I hope that's true. That's them willingly and choosing not to, to take God for who he is. They, they, they don't want to acknowledge that he is there because they know what it would require of them. This is also a matter of the heart. It's about people preferring to look inward 
looking to themselves for guidance and authority in their life. To these kinds of people, the truth of God is, is simply inconsequential. It's got no bearing on the way they live their life. And that's not about uh, doubt, as it is stubborn refusal. Even the best rational argumentation is not going to resolve this, because again, that's an irrational conviction of the heart. And this is uh, very difficult. And, and possibly it may only take, uh, it may be that only a great deal of suffering in their life can push them to accepting the truth of God. Because they're already far from it, right? Can't push them farther away if, if they're not willing to accept God in the first place. So it's possible that a period of immense hardship will, will bring them to wanting to know the deeper questions of life. But if they don't come to see this, and they aren't nudged in the right direction, the fate of the unbelieving is described in Psalm 103, poetically. As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth, for the wind passeth over it, and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more. To me, that sounds a lot like a dandelion, the wish flowers. You blow on them, they're gone, they're no more. And that's what the psalmist says we are. And that's what is ultimately to be of those who are not brought to see the truth of God. So as we wind things down here and we wrap up our study for the day. I, I want to encourage everybody to, to affirm your own faith. I mean, yes, we all believe the truth of the Bible, and, and we, we know why we believe what we do. But I, I don't think that's any reason to sort of sit on our laurels about it and, and not to, to dig deeper, dig further, to, to be able to be better equipped to make a defense of what we believe and to answer for it. To, you know, um, and, and we really need to, to reach out if we're not already, or maybe even we are, but maybe we should do a better job of reaching out to, to those in our ecclesias who have turned from the truth. Because the fact is they, in some cases, probably just haven't gotten satisfactory answers. And, and I think if we can put to them satisfactory answers, that will go a long way towards bringing about a required change of thinking. But we, of course, have to handle it with discretion and, uh, and certainly mercy as we saw Jesus, uh, on those who doubted, be merciful. Um, but, but do our best to get them what they need, to get them to see the truth, and to not be judgmental about how they could have forsaken and left these things behind for the garbage of the culture today. We are all God's instruments. God can use us to turn back those who have turned from truth, and in so doing, save a soul from death. So I want to end with a quote from Brother Robert Roberts. He says, It is to be feared that we allow ourselves to be influenced by the strongly secular spirit of the age. In our Christianity, to be deluded with prevailing worldliness, let us fear and he's talking about us getting into the culture and the culture in us. Fear it. For neither the worldly-minded nor the lukewarm shall inherit the kingdom of God. Let us guard against faint-heartedness. Let us strive to make of Christianity honest, straightforward, and unblushing. We are apt to be overridden by the external circumstances of the time. We're swimming upstream, fighting against the current. He says, let it be otherwise. Let our characters be known in our circles. Let our light shine in the surrounding darkness. And so may we glorify our Father in heaven and receive his approval at last.